I may interrupt you and uh, bring you to the next session. The next session is to, you ought to be addressed by Julian Lisa, who will be speaking about the Constitutional Convention. Julian Lisa, I think, was one of the youngest, if not the youngest, alderman in New South Wales in the, uh, in the People's Republic of Wallara. where he, I, if I recall correctly, he ensured that the Queen's portrait hung in the right place and stayed in the right place. Uh, Julian then became, I think, the youngest delegate to the Constitutional Convention. So he's making all the, uh, these remarkable moments in his life. At, as the youngest delegate of the Constitutional Convention, he, with Lloyd Waddy, made two of the most amusing remarks. I'll tell you later about uh, Lloyd's remark, or a few remarks of Lloyd's, but uh, uh, Julian gave a speech which was received with great amusement. Uh, and it related to a song, if I recall correctly. And he will no doubt not only tell you about it, but probably sing it for you. <laughs> By profession, he is a lawyer, but I know you won't hold that against him. He, uh, he practiced as a solicitor with some of the eminent firms in Sydney and then worked uh, in the office of the Attorney General, in the personal office of the Attorney General, Philip Ruddock, where he no doubt played a significant role in advising the minister about various matters and appointments, perhaps. He was then the executive director of the Menzies Research Centre, which is the research arm of the Liberal Party, which uh, plays such a significant role in giving intellectual depth to that party. And uh, in that office, he completely updated the website so that it was a very modern and effective website and also ensured that a, a number of significant uh, intellectual events were held which could give assistance to those members of the Liberal Party who wanted that. He was, he's also become the convener of the Samuel Griffith Society, which is the Federalist body. In fact, the, I think the 600 members of the Samuel Griffith Society are probably the only Federalists left in Australia. And he's now doing something magical on the, uh, with the Australian Catholic University. I'm not sure but I, what it exactly is, but I hope it is converting Professor Greg Craven back from his apostasy as a Republican and getting him to reconvert to constitutional monarchy. Ladies and gentlemen, Julian Lisa. Thank you so much, Professor David Flint. Um, I think the ACM is really truly blessed to be convened and have been convened by two extraordinary Australians. I'll come to the first Australian in a second, but to David, you know, your energy, your passion, the fact that you never, ever lose your cool in debate um, is really extraordinary. And the fact that, you know, uh, 20 years after the organisation was founded, 12 years after we defeated the Republic referendum, that a conference of a couple of hundred people can come to Wagga Wagga and assemble is a huge tribute to the work that you do. So thank you so much, David. Yeah. I want to acknowledge a, a few other people in the room before I commence the, the, the substance of my remarks. To Jai Martinkovitz, Jai, you are the worthy successor to Tony Abbott and to Kerry Jones in this role. I, I hope that your career at ACM continues uh, in this great upward trajectory. I think uh, any organisation uh, which is often associated with older Australians who can bring your passion, your youth and your knowledge of technology to reach a whole new audience of younger Australians. I was amazed at the level of engagement uh, on Facebook that ACM has now of younger Australians. I think that's really tremendous. And I know that if a referendum were held tomorrow, that we would be in very good fighting shape because of your leadership. So thank you, Jai, for all the work you do. Can I acknowledge Rhonda Shipp, uh, who is uh, the great stalwart of the, of the Wagga Wagga 
branch of ACM. I came down, I think it must have been 1998, because I was on my way between Sydney and Melbourne. My now wife and I were doing a driving trip. I was uh, writing an honours thesis and had to go to Melbourne to do some research. And we decided we would stop in at Wagga overnight. And uh, Rhonda and Joe very kindly uh, put us up for the night. And uh, I was here to address an, an ACM function, which was, like today, extremely well attended. Rhonda, the fact that you can muster a crowd like this uh, is really uh, an extraordinary tribute to you and your organisational ability and your, your, your deep commitment uh, to ACM as a cause. So thank you, Rhonda, for all you do. I want to acknowledge that great volunteer for ACM, Philip Gibson. You can't have an ACM function anywhere without having Philip Gibson. And Philip tells me he's got a bad back, so you don't want him to have to lug all these materials here back to Sydney, so make sure he doesn't lug any materials back to Sydney. Take them with you. They're free, they're worth reading, and most of them have been written by Philip himself. So, Philip, well done for all the work you do. I want to acknowledge two people in this room who were right there at the beginning with ACM, two of the founders, to Doug Sutherland, who, uh, who led the ACM No Republic ticket at the 1998 Constitutional Convention elections in New South Wales, where we achieved a tremendous result of having four of our delegates elected, which was tremendous. Uh, Doug, I know sometimes your, your party, the Labor Party, has frustrated you on this issue by not allowing its members a free vote, but I've always admired the way in which, despite that, you have, uh, you have kept true to the Crown and uh, been a great Labor force and a Labor voice in our movement. So thank you for all that you have done. I come to, uh, finally, my friend Lloyd Waddy, who's sitting up the back there with all of his friends on a table by himself. And, uh, <laughs> Lloyd, you have been my, my great guide, philosopher and friend, as I think uh, Glanville Williams, one of his books, was originally described in, in the law many, many years ago. Uh, Lloyd, the fact that you uh, took a gamble, the fact that you decided that it was important to stand up for the cause that you believed in and that all of us here believe in all those years ago when it was so unfashionable, um, really says that uh, you have, uh, you're a man of enormous courage. Uh, you're also a man of enormously good humour, and uh, I know we're all looking forward to hearing from you this afternoon um, on that. Lloyd, I am so grateful to you for your friendship for many, many years, and all of us here are grateful to you for what you did in establishing this organisation. So join me, please, in <laughs> thanking Lloyd at this time. It was 20 years ago this year that Australians for Constitutional Monarchy was founded. 1992, as you'll remember, was the Queen's Annus Horribilis. Think about what a bad year it was for her. Her home had burnt down, her eldest son had got divorced, and she'd been groped by the Lizard of Oz Prime Minister Paul Keating. <laughs> Those who took a short view of history thought that a republic in Australia must be inevitable. But into all of this came Australians for constitutional monarchy. We said to Keating, hands off our flag, hands off our constitution, and hands off our queen. And we won. I find it remarkable, as I say, that all this time later, when the debate is, is not raging at all, that we can still gather here together, that there's still enthusiasm about the importance of maintaining the crown in our system. It's been a while since I've spoken at an ACM function, and uh, as David has mentioned, I was for the last six and a half years the executive director of the Liberal Party's think tank. And while my, my passion for the cause and my support of the crown in Australia never wavered, I thought during that time, because it's been an issue that's divided the party, that it was not appropriate for me to speak at an ACM function. So this year, while, I've, uh, while I'm now working for, ironically, the man who authorised the yes case ads, including one that said, which do you prefer, your family or the royal family, uh, despite that fact, I'm now working at uh, ACU for a great Republican, um, I'm very pleased to come back and talk to a great group of monarchists whose views that I share very, very strongly. I think there are three things that made ACM uh, an important organisation, that continue to make ACM an important organisation and made us successful. And they are the three Ds of the Republic debate. We, are, we were an organisation that was distinguished, diverse and droll. And I want to explain each of those in turn and why they're important. Firstly, we gathered together at the foundation of ACM a group of really first-class lawyers. ACM, the history of ACM was in some respects, a lawyer's movement. Some would say a lawyer's picnic. Uh, but you had people there like Sir Harry Gibbs, the former Chief Justice of Australia. You had 
Justice Michael Kirby, who was then the President of the Court of Appeal. You had uh, distinguished barristers like Lloyd Waddy. You had retired judges like Jack Lee. You had future judges uh, like Ken Handley. Uh, you had distinguished legal academics like David Flint and Colin Howard. These people brought great heft, great legal heft to the debate which we were having. And it reminded people that this was not a debate about symbols, but that this was a debate about a legal document, our founding document as a country, our constitution. And we had not only those very distinguished lawyers who were involved early on, we even had a legal committee of ACM that used to make submissions to inquiries. And there are some quite famous names on that committee, including the future High Court Judge Dyson Hayden and the future Federal Court Judge Arthur Emmett. I think that this distinguished group of people showed to Australians that this was not a normal debate, that this wasn't just the political argy-bargy, but that something more was at stake. And so I think that uh, ACM should never lose that connection uh, with, with lawyers of real quality. The second thing about ACM has been its diversity. We have never been a monolithic monocultural group, and that's very important. We had great Australians from all walks of life involved in this organisation. From Neville Bonner, the first Aboriginal person to sit in our parliament, to Dame Leonie Kramer, the first woman to become professor and head a department at a university. We had uh, distinguished soldier surgeons like Digger James and Weary Dunwell. Helen Sham Ho, the first Chinese-born Australian uh, to, to sit, uh, the first Chinese-born person to sit in the parliament. People of all religions, Anglicans, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, young people like myself, like Sophie Mirabella, who you'll hear from this evening, who when she got involved in ACM was indeed a young person. Um, there were liberals like Jim Killen and Reg Tokata Withers, and there were Labor stalwarts like Doug and like uh, Jack Snelling, who's now the treasurer in South Australia. ACM's never been a political faction of any party, and I think that's really important. And in the context of the Liberal Party, there were always people in our organisation who represented the progressive, the liberal and the conservative wings of that party involved in our organisation too, and that's very important. So the diversity was its strength. The third thing was something that Lloyd really brought to ACM, and that was ACM was droll. It was humorous. Lloyd's first law of monarchy, if I could put it that way, was that we should always take the debate seriously, but never ourselves. And not all of us are as funny as Lloyd, but uh, in full flight, a great waddy after dinner speech could make you laugh so hard you'd cry. And Lloyd never lost an opportunity to make a joke about himself or an aspect of the debate or some of the Republicans. But he earned great affection from us and even from his opponents because he never played the man, he always played the ball. And I think if we stick to the, those principles of distinguished, diverse and droll, we will survive and grow as an organisation, whether there's a debate on or not, and we will be ready if another debate comes. I want to talk a little bit about my own involvement in ACM, in particular uh, in the uh, lead up to the referendum uh, period and the Constitutional Convention. In 1992, I was a schoolboy, and I'd just done a school play with the local girls' school, and I met an extraordinary girl there. Uh, she and I both were quite interested in politics and Paul Keating had just become Prime Minister and we, we both decided we would, uh, we would get involved in the local Liberal Party there. Her grandfather had been a member of the Country Party, in fact he'd been a, uh, a very distinguished Australian and his name was Sir Asher Joel. He, uh, some of you might remember him, he organised a number of the Royal Tours and the Pope's visits and uh, he was one of the founders of public relations in Australia. And uh, one of the things that Paul Keating was doing that none of us liked was the idea that, uh, you know, th was promoting this idea that there was something deficient about our country and our constitution that could be rectified if only we kicked out that foreign queen, to use his, his language. Well, I didn't want to be part of that and I wanted to fight against it. And Sir Asher had received an invitation from Sir John Atwell, who was a member of the founding council, to become involved in ACM. And he said, Julian, I know how passionate you are about this. Why don't you get involved? And so I did, and I, was, uh, I joined up. My original member number was 134, so I must have been quite an early member of ACM, still as, still as a 16-year-old. Um, my view's always been Australia's got one of the best constitutions in the world. We're lucky to have a constitutional monarch like Elizabeth II. We're lucky to have an absentee monarch. It keeps uh, nationalism down here, and it's wonderful to use an argument Michael Kirby often made, that we share our monarch 
with a number of other countries around the world because it gives us a, a point of unity and a point of connection with people in Canada and Papua New Guinea and Fiji and New Zealand that we otherwise might not, not have. As a schoolboy in 92 and 93, I'd go along to uh, these ACM conferences and you'd hear from amazing speakers like Malcolm McKerris talking about some of the electoral implications of, uh, uh, of, of actually trying to get a referendum to change the constitution or what our chances were of preventing that. You'd hear from great lawyers and academics. You'd hear um, people like, uh, I think it was Colin Teal who, uh, who used to read poetry at ACM conferences. I mean, these were great events to go to. And for a young man, it was inspiring to meet really amazing Australians. Um, and I remember going to that very big rally. A number of you would have been there at the end of 1993 in the town hall where there were 2,000 people, people hanging out to, at the balconies. And uh, what an exciting event it was to be there at that time. After I finished school, I went to the University of New South Wales and uh, I encountered an amazing politics academic called John Paul. Some of you would have heard John speak over the years and uh, one of the great um, things that John has is a great knowledge of referendums and of constitutional history. And he explained in his lectures uh, about the constitutional conventions that underpin our constitution and the difficulties uh, of achieving constitutional change. And John's always been a great supporter of the monarchy. Gough Whitlam had a, uh, had a great quip about John Paul. He said, that damn John Paul who thinks he's infallible, uh, which, uh, which John always liked to tell us. Now, I had a university experience like most others. My drinking and chasing of girls was occasionally interrupted by university examinations, which uh, were must, much less fun. But uh, one of the things that I did at university which was important was to establish a club on campus called Young Australians Against the 2001 Republic. The year was 1995, the Republicans' goal was let's be a republic by 2001, and we produced a little flyer, and we had a great Zanetti cartoon on the front. And in this cartoon, Paul Keating and the Queen are talking, and Keating says to the Queen, he says, you know, when you become useless and unpopular, it's time to think about going. And the Queen retorts, so when are you resigning? <laughs> it was a great cartoon. And we had 500 members in our, in our club. It was really good, largely because we were not a pro-monarchy club per se, but we were against a specific republic model that was floated at the time. And that was a really good lesson for me because it was a reminder that part of our job in promoting the crown in a referendum is to divide and conquer, to realise that there are some republicans who will not like the republic model and we need to bring them into our tent to campaign no with us. And that's what we successfully did in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1999. In 1995, as David mentioned, I got elected at age 19 to uh, local council, and I did an interview one morning just after the elections with Andrew Olley. A number of you will remember the journalist Andrew Olley, a, a very good journalist uh, on uh, um, 2BL. And uh, he said, why did a person of your age decide to run for council? And I gave him all the reasons about our local council not being well managed and so on. And then I said to him, and there's one other reason. He said, what's that? And I said, I want to show to people that not everyone who is young thinks that a republic's a good idea. And he was amazed to hear this. And that morning, Michael Kirby was listening in his chambers and he rang Lloyd Waddy and he said, who is this Julian Lisa fellow? And uh, we need to get him more involved. And uh, one of the lovely things about ACM is the way in which they have encouraged so many young people to get involved. It doesn't surprise me that they have an executive director who is Jai's age because that's the nature of this organisation. It gives young people opportunities. And so Lloyd and Kerry uh, got me involved, and sorry, Lloyd and Tony, it might, might have been still at that time, uh, got me involved in producing a video for school students about you know, what are some of the issues around creating a republic uh, in Australia and why it's a bad idea. At the end of 1997, the Prime Minister John Howard announced that there would be a constitutional convention to determine whether Australia should be a republic or not. And uh, Kerry Jones invited me not just to be on the ticket, but to be number three on the ticket. So my position was highly electable. Now, you know the sort of people that are involved in ACM. You know the sort of people that are in this room today. Lots of people of achievement and distinction. And they wanted me, a 20-year-old as I was then. Why? They said they wanted somebody who was young, who could put a good case for the crown. And it was a great honour to be on the ticket, to be even somewhere on that ticket, but to be so high. Um, I was hugely grateful for that opportunity. And we campaigned all over New South Wales. We had uh, 
launches and uh, meetings, and I think it may have been in that context that I was here in, uh, in, in Wagga at the time. And we got elected. Now, uh, the Constitutional Convention that convened in the um, February 1998 was an uh, extraordinary experience. And the contrasts between the monarchists and the republicans were there, and they were very stark, and they were apparent right from the beginning. While we stayed at a modest motel, the Garden City Premier Inn at Narrabunda, the Republicans stayed in a five-star hotel on the lake. You can't create a people's republic from the local best western, I like to say. Um, and I think that was one of the early contrasts. We were a genuine grassroots people's movement. They were a plaything of a certain group of uh, inner city elites, um, which David Flint has written about a great deal. So what was the atmosphere like and what was a day like at the Constitutional Convention? Every morning I'd get up at five because I like to write my speeches first thing in the morning. It was a great, to, a great thing to do to get up and write a speech and get your thoughts down on paper. Uh, I had been appointed by the ACM group uh, as the deputy whip to a very distinguished former Victorian minister, um, Jim Ramsey. And Jim and I would meet at uh, about 7, 7.30 for breakfast and I'd try out my speech on him for the day and uh, we'd talk about some of the tactics we'd use for the day. And then later in the morning we would all gather together under Lloyd's leadership at Old Parliament House where he'd give us the, the marching orders for the day and he'd say, you looked like a rabble yesterday, you know, smarten up your act or, um, you know, there are too many people who are, who are not in while we're having important speeches, you need to sit in more often. And we would debate the tactics of the day. Those meetings would usually adjourn and then there'd be more people preparing speeches. And uh, the speech that David referred to so kindly, the one I made, was actually partly influenced by an idea that David had come up with, that the Republic was really uh, demonstrative of the absolutely fabulous effect. Who remembers the television show Absolutely Fabulous? And were there those two drunk baby boomer women who drank too much bolly and stolly and smoked a lot of pot and remembered the 50s and or remembered the 60s rather. What did Jefferson Airplane say? If you could remember the 60s, you weren't really there. Um, they, uh, they, they would uh, go, go around and they had a young daughter who was about my age called Safi, who was very sensible and studious. And they had a, a mother who also didn't approve of their antics either. And that was the Republic debate. It was popular among the baby boomers, but it wasn't popular among older Australians or younger Australians. And I said uh, basically that the Republican movement was the, uh, uh, the, the zenith of a generation who values style over substance, to whom touchy-feely kumbaya motherhood notions matter more than results. And John Howard came over to me uh, at the convention. He said, that was the line of the convention, Julian. It was so funny. And he still, when he sees me from time to time, remembers it. And I was embarrassed that he put that line in his book, Lazarus Rising. Uh, such was the impact it had on him. But uh, that was really partly uh, the good work of uh, talking with David and refining speeches and lines and so on uh, in the morning. And so, David, I'm particularly grateful to you for putting the absolutely fabulous idea in my head. One of the things that I think we did well as the ACM team was that we opposed all models. We were there to vote no to every model available. We weren't there to try and split the Republicans and play play funny games like some of our parliamentarians do, we were elected a, on a no republic basis. And uh, we behaved in a very honourable way, and that was really, again, I've got to thank Lloyd again here, it was really due to his leadership. Uh, it was not only the right thing to do politically, it was the right thing to do morally too. And it was the right thing to do by the people who'd sent us to the convention. And as you know, at the end of the convention, um, the issue of whether Australia should become a republic or not was put for the vote. As a general issue, it, that achieved a majority support, but the Keating-Turnbull model, which became the model that came out of the uh, Constitutional Convention, didn't actually get an absolute majority. But John Howard said, look, there's a clear view here that this is the most popular of the models, and I'm happy to put that to a referendum. Now, John Howard gets blamed a lot of the time for the Republicans' loss, and it's completely unfair. They wanted this Republic referendum in 1999. They chose the model. He didn't influence the model. He, uh, he, he put it to the people and the people voted no. And uh, I think he, he did exactly the right thing. On the Yes Committee, we had a very different group of people. Uh, we were chaired by Kerry Jones. 
We had Senator Ron Boswell and Alan Ferguson, Sir David Smith and Dame Leonie Kramer, Digger James, two direct election Republicans, um, Clem Jones and Ted Mack, who were very, very important, and then two young delegates, myself and Heidi Zwar. We were both in our 20s and we were in this room with all these really amazing, distinguished Australians. Heidi and I thought it would be a good idea for the first meeting of the committee for us to put some ideas down on paper because we thought, well, if we do it together, they might listen to us more. We needn't have worried, they were going to listen at any rate, but we thought that would be a good way of clarifying our own thinking. The key thing that we said was it was important for us to campaign around a unified, simple message. The second thing that we said was that the debate over whether you wanted a monarchy or a republic as a matter of principle was over. It's finished, it's dead. The debate in a referendum campaign is do you want the particular model of republic on offer? We also acknowledged that we had two direct election republicans on our committee. And we noted that for 10 years or more, the polls had indicated that 70% of people who wanted a republic wanted to vote for the president themselves. So we came up with the slogan, if you can't vote for the president, vote no to this republic. Now when the committee looked at this and when it was tested in the various um, focus groups and by the pollsters and advertisers, they of course came up with the slogan, if you want to vote for the president, vote no to the politicians republic. But the germ of the idea was there in our first strategy paper. Um, and I'm so grateful to have been part of that no case committee. It was a tremendous one of the great things that differentiated us from the Republicans, and that's the people on the committees, and it's the people manning the booths, and it's the people doing the door knocking, and the people organising the fundraisers, is on the Republican side, they all wanted to be father or mother of the Republic. It was my Republic. For us, it was never about us as individuals. It was about a cause that was greater than all of us. It was about our constitution and our heritage, and I think that's really, and it was about our future too, the future of Australia, and the sort of system of government we wanted to have. And I think that was a really, really important thing. And of course, we won a famous victory, as we've heard this morning. 72% of federal electorates, 55% of Australians in every single state and the Northern Territory. Only the ACT um, voted in favour of the, of the Republic referendum. So what are the key lessons that we can learn from the Republic campaign for the future? I think there are four key lessons. The first one is unity. The original ACM charter, which we are essentially reaffirming in this Wagga Wagga charter that we've seen today, promotes the fact that we are a diverse organisation. Different political backgrounds, different beliefs, different life experiences, different generations. And we all have different reasons to support the system. Some of us love the constitution, some of us think it's the least worst system on offer, some of us think we're a crowned republic, some of us just love the Queen herself. And in a republic referendum, some republicans don't particularly like the model. Whatever your reason for opposing, it doesn't matter. The fact that you oppose is vital. And the fact that you are there united to oppose is the most important thing that we found from the referendum campaign. The unity of purpose, the unity of message, I think, was vital. The second key point can be summarised in the phrase, it's not about us, it's about them. Let me say that to you again. It's not about us, it's about them. In a, re in a public referendum campaign, Australians know what it's like to live under the monarchy. We've lived under it for 214 years. It's a great system of government. We know the freedoms it's provided for us. We know how the system works. The system is not on trial. What is on trial is the republican model that is proposed. And that republican model deserves to be subjected to the greatest scrutiny possible. And we need to focus in any referendum campaign on them, on their model and on how it would be better, it has to be better, than what we've got now. The third particular point is, it's not about them, it's about Australians. And what does this mean? I've just said it's not about us, it's about them. And now I'm telling you it's actually not about them, it's about Australians. The difference between those of us who believe in our system and those of us who don't, and those who don't, is that we believe in the wisdom of Australians. They don't. We believe that Australians are good at making decisions about their constitution. And ultimately, the brilliance of the framers of our constitution was that they left decisions about the future of the constitution to the people. 
and it's the people who have to vote to change the Constitution. And what I think the Republican movement had forgotten was that most people were not interested in changing the Constitution. I think the biggest slab of the no vote is not people who like the current system, who like the monarchy, and it's not people who want a direct election republic or some other republic either. But it's people who said, we've got a great country, we're proud of our country, we've got some real problems, why are you wasting my time on a problem that doesn't need to be solved? Chuff off. That was the biggest slab, I think, of the no vote. And uh, we have to remember that, that it, it's always about Australians. It's not about the plaything of some Chardonnay Republicans um, in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. My final message is that as the last 20 years have, de have demonstrated and as the whole history of monarchy uh, uh, in our own country demonstrates is that the magic of the monarchy is its capacity to reinvent itself and to reinvent itself like no other institution. In 1992, we saw the monarchy at the, low, at the lowest ebb it's probably ever been in. As I said at the beginning, the Queen called it her Annus Horribilis. But now, look how things have changed. We saw that great presentation by Jai and David this morning. We saw the service of the Queen and Prince Philip being so warmly celebrated by people all over the Commonwealth, not least in our own country, um, when they came here to visit uh, in relation to the Jubilee celebrations, in relation to their support for victims of fire and flood and drought. We saw people standing 10 and 20 deep in Brisbane and in Perth. Um, you know, in the early 90s, people would have said, oh, you'll never see that again. And yet we did, because there's something about monarchy that we can see that's bigger than the political argy-bargy of the day. The second element of this is the wonderful royal wedding. Everyone can relate to the fact of the hope and love of a, of a new couple getting married and the, and the optimism that that provides people. And I think that that's a great thing. Some tawdry political deal that produces you a president doesn't have the same kind of feeling as the hope and joy of a, of a couple in love and the success of their wedding. Even later this year when we have the visit of Prince Charles and, and uh, uh, Camilla, um, I think it will remind people of the urbanity and humanity of the, of the Prince of Wales, a man who was very, very unpopular 20 years ago and who he himself has managed to reinvent himself. And finally, as much as we might dislike the treatment uh, of Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge, by the French magazines who've decided to take a photo of her topless, let's remember that Kate's beauty is part of the strength of our system. No one wants to look at a, at a picture of a politician with their kid off Particularly, no one wants to look at a picture of a French politician with their kid off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>